Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel event, Post Row America. Thank you all for coming. This is probably the most packed I've seen the chamber ever for a panel event, which really is a testament to the importance of what we're about to discuss here, and also a testament to Helena and Laura for all their hard work with this. I'm just going to briefly introduce the panel before I'm going to hand over uh, to the co-presidents of the Cambridge University Free Productive Rights Society. Uh, they will be chairing this panel, leading this discussion, um, but just to briefly explain our thought process behind setting up this event. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about abortion itself, about the legalization of abortion, but I didn't feel that was a productive conversation to be held in this chamber. I wanted to focus on, or we, sorry, I should say, wanted to focus on the impacts of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, how this is going to impact ordinary women, ordinary individuals across communities, rural communities, urban communities in America. And we really wanted to highlight the way that we can all stand in solidarity with individuals going through this process and examine these impacts, analyze our own position, and try and draw attention to the real impacts that are going to be felt by everyday people. I'm now going, this is the last, also, this is the last event of our open period at the Cambridge Union. Um, this event is held in um, collaboration with Kerr, uh, but for the Cambridge Union, this is the last period um, where you'll be able to buy discounted membership. So if you haven't bought membership, do it already. Also, after this event, um, there will be a social in the Orator Bar afterwards for uh, the Reproductive Rights Society. We have the opportunity to join. If you're also not already a member of that society, get a chance to meet the speakers if you don't touch on any topics. Um, but I have rambled on for more than enough time. So without further ado, please welcome Helena, Laura, and our amazing panelists. Thank you. Um, is my mic on? That sounds on. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everybody for coming. We had absolutely no idea what kind of turnout to expect from this event. And as Ellie said, this is a huge turnout for an equalities event. So for our launch event, it's really encouraging to see yeah. so many of you here. We'll have a social in the bar afterwards, as Ellie mentioned, where you can buy membership, which is only five pounds for life. And all of it goes towards <laughs> wow. building panels like this, campaigning, uh, getting transport for us to go to protests, things like that. So, uh, and hopefully making merchandise, which is very cool, it will be available soon. Uh, so we only, we're a very new society. We only were founded a couple of months ago in the wake of what happened in America because there have been a lot of pro-life societies at universities for quite some time and there was never any sort of coherent resistance to them. But although this event is on abortion and most of what we've done so far is on abortion, we're not only uh, uh, about abortion, we're going to cover topics like IVF, uh, same-sex adoption, uh, parenting, uh, contraception, anything that falls under the umbrella of reproductive rights. And all of our events are going to be non-partisan, evidence-based, with experts just as brilliant as these four that I have behind me. So I'll pass you over to Helena, who's going to introduce those experts to you, and then hopefully this will be a productive panel. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, I'll go this way around. So here next to me is Melissa Upreti, who's been the chair of the United Nations Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls until last week, <laughs> handed the chair over, which is a group of human rights experts which has strongly condemned the overturning of Roe v. Wade on human rights grounds. Ms. Upreti has a long career as an outstanding human rights lawyer, including at the Centre for Reproductive Rights as their plaintiff for the 2007 case that recognised abortion as a constitutional right in Nepal. Uh, here we have Professor Robin Fretwell Wilson, who's got legal expertise in, you name it, healthcare, religious freedom, LGBT rights, family law, bioethics. She's a law professor at the University of Illinois system, where her research has followed US policies on abortion access, as well as the connection between LGBT rights and reproductive rights. Dr. Richard Johnson, uh, who's actually a Cambridge alumni, um, is a senior lecturer in US politics and policy at Queen Mary University of London. His 2020 book, The End of the Second Reconstruction, was a warning about the perils of US judicial supremacy and the risk that civil rights victories can easily be undone. And his most recent academic article, you should check it out, it does examine the Supreme Court decision on Dobbs and the 14th Amendment. And last but not least, Dr. Natalie Capp, trained as an obstetrician gynecologist in the US, She's now Chief Medical Officer at the International Planned Parenthood Federation, and her research and advocacy on policies and practices for safe abortion has also included roles as Medical Director at IPAS, uh, in the WHO's Department of Reproductive Health and Research. So yeah, four fantastic speakers. So yeah, let's get started. We've got a lot, of, lot to cover. Brilliant. So we're basically going to divide the uh, questions into three sections. The first one being, how did we get here? How did uh, American politics start to divide along religious lines? How did abortion become such a hot issue? Uh, and how did Roe fall? 
Then we're going to discuss what are the impacts of it in America and for the rest of the world. And then finally, we're going to discuss what we can actually do about it and what charities can do about it, what governments can do and what the prognosis is for the next couple of decades. So I'll start off with you, Richard, if you don't mind, um, and then everyone just jump in. So I wondered if you could explain to us what the basis for the original Roe v. Wade judgment was from a legal standpoint. Yeah, so in order to get to where the Supreme Court was in 1973, we actually have to go back a bit to the beginning of American constitutional history. I'm going to give a very quick, rough and ready overview of that. The, the case Roe v. Wade was based on a doctrine called substantive due process. If we go back to when the Constitution was written, 1787, 1788, almost immediately after that, a set of amendments were added to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Uh, these first 10 amendments largely pertain to the rights of individuals and protecting them against the actions of the federal government. Many of these are some of the most famous elements of the Constitution, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, the right to be free in your uh, persons and effects from unreasonable search and seizures, protection from cruel and unusual punishment, etc. One of those amendments is the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment says, in effect, that there are other individual rights that are not named here, and the fact that these rights are not named in this Bill of Rights does not mean that these rights do not exist and you're not protected from them. But the Bill of Rights initially only applied to the federal government, the national government of the United States. And so that meant that state governments were free to restrict liberties that were protected in the Bill of Rights. So states had established churches. States had religious tests for office. In some states, you had to uh, believe in God or in, even be a Protestant in order to hold public uh, office. Uh, some states severely restricted freedom of speech. Probably the most infamous example is in some southern states, it was a, a capital crime to uh, publish or advocate for the abolition of slavery. So it wasn't until the Civil War in the 1860s that this changed when after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment, I'd argue probably the most important of the amendments, although there's good competition for, for it, um, apply, start, basically leads us on a road that applies these individual liberties against state governments. And this is called the due process clause. And it says that state governments may not deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And then the question is, what is liberty? And the Supreme Court, over many decades, has to interpret what liberty is. In some cases, it's obvious, because it's what's listed in those first eight amendments, right, right to speech and uh, assembly and religion and so on. But we know that these other rights that are not mentioned in, in, in the, uh, uh, that, that still exist. And so in the 60s and 70s, the court starts to apply these to matters of privacy. It says that there's a fundamental right to privacy. First, or an earlier case has to do with contraception, the right for first married couples and then unmarried couples to um, use contraception. Uh, and Roe is part of that. And the court says that one of these fundamental rights uh, is a right for a, a person to terminate her pregnancy. And so that's where we get to with Roe. And it's a long answer, but I just wanted everyone to kind of be on wet. When people say, oh, well, abortion isn't in the Constitution, well, neither is the right to marry. But that is, that's federally protected as well. And it comes out of the Ninth and the Fourteenth Amendment. Mm. So I know we have a fairly international panel, uh, a couple of Americans. I wonder if we could briefly discuss when did abortion become an issue that the general public were so invested in and it become an issue that candidates might rise or fall based on because it certainly wasn't always mm. this much of a politicized yeah. issue. I'll take that. Um, you know, we've become more divided about abortion than we were in 1973. Um, people in 73 uh, thought that there should be rape exceptions, that there should be incest exceptions, there should be protections for life of the mother, that's a Hyde Amendment term. Um, and we became progressively more divided uh, since then. And I think part of it is the rise of, of evangelicals and the religious right. And here I'm not trying to bash a particular group, but just be descriptive of a set of people that, in terms that you would understand or resonate with you, but evangelicals started to self-define, in particular, in opposition to abortion and other issues. So they roughly, clustered. Roughly when was that? 
well, you 80s, 90s, and, and on. Um, so you've actually seen a fracturing of sort of consensus around abortion, but there's still a surprising amount of consensus uh, among the American people about needed exceptions. And what's sort of ironic is the states uh, across the 50 states don't match up with the intuitions of the American people about what kinds of exceptions they'd like to see. We can talk about why that is. Yeah, I mean, it's true when you look at polling of just the average voter, um, depending on how you word, how you phrase um, the, the sentence that people can endorse, um, most people think that abortion should be available um, and legal for women who need it. Mm. So if the polling is like this, how did we get to this position? If the polling is what you said it is, why is abortion now going to be legal in a number of states? What's the mechanisms by which this has happened? Well, I mean, if I may add something, if it com when it comes to the issue of abortion, what we see very often, and this is not limited to the United States and what we're seeing now, but in many parts of the world, the issue is very deliberately instrumentalized and it's used to advance another, a much larger agenda, which I would describe in very simple terms as being more patriarchal and one that is not respected respectful of the human rights of women. Um, you know, speaking of timelines, in 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, was adopted, um, the United States actually played a really important role in that whole process, along with many other states in the conceptualization and in the framing of many different rights. So they have had a strong influence on that framework. That was followed by the uh, formulation and adoption of several core international treaties that actually went on to explain what the different provisions in the Universal Declaration actually meant, uh, what it meant uh, to, you know, how states are obligated to realize that um, every, every human being is born with equal dignity. Um, you know, human dignity is really the sort of background value or is what really underpins the whole human rights system. And how we realize that as a global community, as governments, as individuals, is in recognizing a number of different rights, a range of civil and political rights, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights. And these are articulated in treaties. Uh, when it comes to women, um, you know, there are many who believe, and I think rightly so, that the Universal Declaration was probably not written with women in mind specifically. You'll see words like brotherhood and you see sort of male sort of references. So this is something that women actually fought for. And there's, there was, there's a whole global feminist movement. It was really only in Vienna in 1993 uh, during the World Conference on Human Rights. Um, and at the end of that year, uh, there was a declaration adopted by the General Assembly which very explicitly recognized women's rights as human rights and violence against women as a human rights violation. So the default has really been to be very, to sort of, has been very patriarchal and one that sort of instrumentalizes women and that's also man has manifested through, for example, the criminalization of abortion the criminalization of adultery, the criminalization of prostitution. I mean, criminalize, criminalization or criminal laws have been used to control female behavior. In many, control, in many countries, abortion restrictions are also colonial legacies. So there are a combination of factors that I think have contributed to a legal landscape where we have seen somehow abortion is, is sort of turned into this very, it's almost like a political time bomb and this, you know, such as when, in fact, it's, it's a simple medical procedure. Uh, having an abortion is actually safer than giving birth. Uh, but the whole narrative has been one that actually undermines um, and sort of seeks to restrict and deny access as a way of controlling women, which then leads to violations of rights and protections that are very clear under international law. And the standards have evolved incrementally over the last three or four decades, I would say. But abortion restrictions under international law very clearly violate women's right to life, right to health, right to privacy, right to freedom from cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, right to freedom from violence, and the right to non-discrimination, and the right to equality. I'll go, well, I'll say one thing just about how we wound up here. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think when Roe and Casey sat there for 50 years, it became very easy for Casey being... Oh, I'm sorry, um, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which was a reaffirmation of Roe with uh, a slightly different framework about undue burden. But when they that edifice was there for 50 years, and during that time, I think it became very easy in our political system in the United States for people to play identity politics with abortion, and they could pass progressively more restrictive laws, in a sense only be politically rewarded for them from their base, knowing that those laws would be enjoined, would not have effect in their state. And so it had the the weird pull uh, to a, a place that I think ordinary people just don't believe we should be, um, and it just progressively pulled farther and farther to that edge. And that's this case, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. Can we explain how did this case originate? How did it go up to the Supreme Court? Why did they rule the way they did on it? Can I just add, first add a bit on the how we got here, because that, that'll lead us to Dobbs. Uh, I completely agree with Robin's point here. I think there's a, the two stories here. There's a state government story and a federal government story here. So in the 60s, a number of states start to liberalize their abortion laws, uh, Hawaii, Colorado, New York. And the double-edged sword of Roe is it stops those efforts in its tracks because it legalizes abortion across the United States through one decision. What that means then is that feminist campaigners redirect efforts to other campaign activities, at that time in particular, moving on to the Equal Rights Amendment, which was a, an attempt to enshrine gender equality in the Constitution itself. But it's extremely difficult to amend the US Constitution. You need two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate, and three quarters of state governments to do so. And each state government, except for one, has two chambers. So it's, it's, it's a tough job. Uh, and that failed. So in a sense, the counterfactual would be if Roe hadn't come into place, probably a lot of states would have legalized abortion, but not all of them necessarily, um, and maybe not as generously as the Roe framework. Uh, but you'd be working with a slightly different lang landscape in the states. And then what Roe meant, as Robin said, that state governments could have it both ways. Republicans in state governments have it both ways. They could pass laws that attacked abortion, which mu went much further than uh, the general public went, but they would never go into effect. So they didn't, wouldn't get the backlash from the general public, but they would get credit from their Points for trying. core base. Exactly. Um, there's a whole story about the, the, the shift mm -hmm. on the court, but I don't want to mm. monopolize time, so I'll leave it there for now. Can I just give yeah. an example of some of the some yeah. of the of, uh, some of the ways that played out? are things like waiting times. So, um, you know, a woman wants an abortion and um, she's required to come in to the clinic, see a physician, go through a consent form, um, but then she has to wait for three days before she has an abortion. So these are the kinds of, of laws that the, that the states could pass during this time frame that, um, that made them win points, but at the same time didn't actually mean that a woman couldn't have an abortion, which would have broken federal law. Yes, the state, state mm -hmm. legislature is the dog that caught the car, basically, the ones that have banned abortion. Just very quickly before we conclude this uh, section with what Helena mentioned, the Dobbs v. Jackson, I just wanted to ask, do you think it's fair for people now to be criticizing the Democrats for not having done more to enshrine more protections legally than just Roe being the, the main protection for abortion? Or do you think that they really couldn't have done much more than they, than they actually did? Yeah. Can I go ahead, please? Um, you know, I think maybe there wasn't enough recognition that um, a right like this cannot stand on one thing alone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Roe was decided back in the 70s that triggered the antis uh, to really organize and uh, to, to unleash um, the rollback. It really started then, sort of. The rollback didn't happen overnight. It's a culmination of decades of work. In the meantime, I think those um, who believe that Roe gave them the right, and we, we, you know, a constitutional right was established, there wasn't enough focus on building a whole legal and policy infrastructure, infrastructure around it. 
And this is a lesson that I also draw from uh, Nepal, which is where um, I come from. And from my experience there, Nepal had a criminal ban on abortion up until 2002. Actually, when I moved to the United States um, 22 years ago, Nepal still had a criminal ban. Um, but the first wave of change came through an amendment to the criminal provisions that actually legalized abortion. The second wave came through the Lakshmi Dikta case, the constitutional uh, court, the, the court decision that recognized abortion as a constitutionally protected right. That also happened because we had a new constitution by that time following a Maoist insurgency that had very specific provisions recognizing the constitutionality of uh, reproductive rights. But then that court decision created a mandate for uh, comprehensive legislation. So activists started working on that and we managed to secure comprehensive legislation. So over time, progressively, uh, the one, um, you know, the amendment was secured through a number of other strategies. And I think that's what kind of didn't happen in the United States. In fact, there was an unraveling at the state level through all the trap laws and other types of restrictions that were progressively introduced in a very systematic manner. I'll, I'll just say one point on this. I don't, I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in the United States on some subjects, gay marriage, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with you completely that had we content, you know, the arc of gay marriage was for 10 states in the District of Columbia to voluntarily embrace it. And it made it easier for the Supreme Court to recognize, you know, the right of all people to marry in a Burgerfell. So sometimes there's a conversation that proceeds between legislatures and the court that actually helps, you know, cement mm. something in our culture. The one thing to pay attention to, and I know we're going to talk about it in a minute, but I don't think this could have happened for abortion, but can happen for other things that people worry about being threatened right now. So think Lawrence versus Texas, uh, which is also, you know, 14th Amendment due process case, but it uh, struck Texas's anti, um, you know, sodomy law. So that's something that right now, every single person in this room can work to take laws that are not being enforced around sodomy out of state law, take it out before mm -hmm. something comes to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Now, could we have done that with Roe? Maybe, but I think people honestly just never thought we'd be sitting here having yes. this discussion. Mm -hmm. You don't spend time on things that you don't think will happen. Mm -hmm. You go to the next thing that you're hoping to have happen. And so, um, but looking forward, and we'll come back to this at the end, I realize people should be paying attention to these laws that are not presently being enforced mm -hmm. so that they can't be enforced. Rip them out. Something about equal, uh, about gay marriage um, that, that I, I think kind of brought a lot of attention to it in a way that abortion didn't, which is that once you're married in a state that allows it, there are many issues going to other states where it's not allowed, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, with adoption and with, uh, with other kinds of recognitions in the law. And I think one of the issues with abortion is if you have 10 states where abortion is legal and states where it's not, you can go and have an abortion, theoretically, and come back to your state and the state doesn't feel any repercussions from it. And there's no ongoing legal issues. I think that's one one yeah. problem with, with yeah so i think that yeah the just to finish this section about how how did we get here um if somebody could just explain what it was the particular case that rose up the courts that led to roe eventually falling yes so so mississippi had a uh, a ban on abortion after 15 weeks mm -hmm. and this was a much earlier period of time that had been understood to be allowed by Roe and, and Casey, the subsequent uh, decision. It was direct challenge. It was intended to, to challenge the case. And the five, five justices on the court, um, six of them upheld the, of the, the Mississippi ban at fif after 15 weeks, but five went further and overturned the federal right to abortion altogether. Justice Alito, who wrote the opinion, said that abortion was not in fact a substantive due process right. So it was not one of these liberties 
protected by the 14th Amendment. He argued that such a liberty needed to be deeply rooted in the history and tradition of the United States, and he argued that legal abortion was not deeply rooted in the history and tradition of the United States. There are lots of problems with that interpretation. Uh, you can read my article if you want to look at it in, in that. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it calls into question many other uh, cases, not least the gay marriage case, which is a substantive due process case, and same-sex marriage is not deeply rooted in the history and traditions of the United States either. Justice Alito says, well, okay, abortion's different because it involves potential life, so there's a conflicting interest there. But really, Roe and Casey had always recognized that. In fact, the phrase potential life comes out of the Roe uh, opinion. Uh, and so that's why Roe allowed states to put restrictions on access to abortion after a period of initially through the trimester system and then viability. Um, and, and, and so that's really what the, 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 court, the court just went back and said, Roe was bad law, Roe no longer exists. Uh, there could have been a middle ground found, like John Roberts' position that you uphold the Mississippi ban after 15 weeks, but you allow it before 15 weeks, but five of the justices went the whole way and said states can ban it entirely if they wish. And do, do you think that was something that they very much knew that they were going to do as soon as a case allowed them to? I think there was some question as to whether there were five who were prepared to do it. The big question mark, I think, was Brett Kavanaugh, one of Donald Trump's appointees, who might have been persuaded to go with Chief Justice John Roberts, both kind of Bush Republicans. The thing is that they probably personally are against abortion, but there's this notion of stare decisis, the notion that you keep previous decisions, that there's something called a reliance interest. That means people who have come to rely on the law, you don't just flip it um, uh, arbitrarily. You have to take that into consideration as well. And I think Roberts was sensitive to that. Kavanaugh might have been, but in the end, he, he went with the more extreme And they flipped version. it. Yeah. So, and when you say they flipped it, so there is not, there's not a federal ban on abortion. That's not all we're talking. It's not illegal across America. Not now yet. Every state, not, not yet. But now every state decides for themselves. Yes. Yeah? So, mm. how many states are going to restrict abortion? What are these laws now looking like? You talked earlier, Robin, about it being more extreme mm. than before. What is the landscape now in the present day in America? We have 26 states that are restricting presently or moving to restrict abortion. Um, some of them are pretty zealous. So Texas has eight separate laws. <laughs> they stack up and they all have mm -hmm. different exceptions and scope. And so it's a hot mess trying to figure out what the law in any one state is, yet alone 26. But we sort of coded some of these in the last days. I mean, you have seven states that out of the 26 that are in play. I'm not talking about the whole 50, but, you know, seven states that have exceptions for rape and incest out of the 26. One state, Mississippi, only for rape, not incest. I, I can't follow that one. 15 that have none, no rape or incest exception mm -hmm. at all. Um, I spent most of my career in state houses. Um, if I were going to start spending energy on this, I'd start there with the states that have no exceptions for rape and incest. Um, we have states that have exceptions for fetal abnormality. That's true in some of the blue states, um, but not all of the blue states even. So that's interesting. But there are seven that have exceptions, 25 that have none for fetal abnormality. And you have health of the mother, and this is uh, difficult. I'm using high terms, by the way. So mother doesn't mean, you know, only women can be pregnant. But in any event, it's just a high term. But health of the mother, eight states have no exceptions um, at all. And some of the states say that they won't consider the possibility of self-harm to be like a mental health ground. Um, and, you know, that's incredible because there's no place to go in an instance like that, you know, um, in terms of the grounds that you would argue. If I may add one thing about the Dobbs case, I mean, one of the arguments that the plaintiffs made was also that um, with Roe, 
um, the United States is out of step with the rest of the world. Um, and actually, that is one of the questions that we, arguments that we've responded to in our amicus brief, the UN Working Group, which is a special procedure of the Human Rights Council, along with the special raptor on the right to health and a few other mandate holders, we submitted a brief, which I hope you will read. Uh, it's very interesting, and it's just a really good resource. It'll really help you understand what the international standards are. But um, that was really a false claim. Um, the United States is now an outlier, and also based on what Robin described, uh, is completely out of step with the rest of the world and international law. Um, there has been a general trend towards liberalization, and that liberalization has happened largely uh, based on just recognition of the right to health, recognition of women's right to bodily autonomy, um, and also using international law as a basis for law reform. So that argument is something that we countered, but clearly the Supreme Court did not take any of that into account. And even now, some of the calls for a federal ban uh, on abortion, uh, you have powerful people like senators saying that with a federal ban on abortion, the United States will be more in line with Europe and European laws. <laughs> so there's also a lot of disinformation, misinformation that is being um, used to create a lot of confusion and also to try to legitimize all these restrictions. And this retrogression under international law is a violation in and of itself. You cannot retrogress like this. And if you do, then you have to provide an explanation, a legitimate basis for doing so. And the Supreme Court did not do this. So on that topic of misinformation, I wonder if you could briefly comment on the number of these laws that are uh, that people attempt to pass that make it quite clear that the writer does not understand anything at all about female anatomy. I'm thinking of the I laws think what, that are yeah. re-implanting ectopic pregnancies and th these procedures that are not medically possible. We have a physician. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I can talk about what's not med medically possible, absolutely. I mean, certainly, you know, if you don't treat an ectopic pregnancy, women can die, um, and they do. Um, the, the treatment for ectopic pregnancy is, is to remove it. Yes. Which is counted as abortion. Mm -hmm. which, which is in those states that have no exceptions for the life of a mother, mm -hmm. um, we will see an increase in maternal mortality. It's just what's going to happen. Um, either that or, you know, health systems and hospitals and 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 um, doctors will break the law and become criminals. And I don't think that's what's going to happen in Texas. And ectopic pregnancies are not viable, just to... Oh, yeah. Say, they're they're completely non-viable pregnancies. And even pregnancies that had fetal abnormalities that made them very obviously non-viable would not be uh, cases where you could perform a termination or an extraction for the health of the mother, which is just mind-boggling to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, there's no chance whatsoever that that is going to be a healthy baby. So it's purely the mother's health that's at risk, and there's no exception for that. In right. And this is clearly established. It's well established. And, um, uh, you know, I think if we say that they don't know what they're doing or they don't understand, we're kind of letting them off the hook. I think people who are pushing for these restrictions know exactly what they're doing, and they know the human cost. Women's testimonies, I mean, a lot more women have, even in the United States alone, have been providing testimony uh, speaking publicly about their experiences with abortion in spite of the stigma. Uh, and yet, somehow, their stories, uh, they're not being believed, or maybe, you know, it's just a, a, a ruthless agenda that is being advanced in violation of, um, of international law, of women's dignity, and even, you know, now we have a constitutional protection that's gone. So, kind so of in. These women who were pregnant and they woke up the next day and Roe had fallen what what are they going to do now what is an ordinary woman or a pregnant person going to do I'm going to go to Illinois mm. you go look at my part of the country I teach in Illinois looks like a donut it's red all around the outside and blue in the middle and I did an op-ed in the Chicago Tribune that tried to figure out well what does that mean for Illinois women because mm. we have a reproductive health act but you know, where my co-author and I calculate that something like three to four times the number of abortions 
will be done in Illinois in the next month than what we did this time last year. Mm -hmm. So, and, and ironically, sitting there with Roe v. Wade, the 73 case that's been tossed, is an, a companion case called Doe v. Bolton. And I think it's still good law. And Doe v. meaning it sits there. It still has effect. And it's, it was a case in which Georgia, at the time of Roe v. Wade, the same year, uh, wanted to have a committee of doctors decide whether somebody could get an abortion. That's actually very similar to the UK, so I hope we talk about that at some point. But the second piece was you could only have an abortion under Georgia law at that time if you were a Georgia resident. And the Supreme Court said no. No, you can't give preference to your own residents for a health care procedure. Now, they had a caveat. They said, oh, if you're at capacity, the system can't possibly do more, maybe, but they didn't decide that question. Well, Illinois is at capacity, but if Doe v. Bolton is good law, that means that Illinois' right to reproductive health care for its citizens is more ephemeral than real. They're going to be taking a ticket right along with the people from Kentucky and Michigan mm -hmm. and Indiana and Missouri and every single state that borders us. Mm. Similarly, in New York, I think New York uh, State also right after Roe fell, the governor actually allocated additional resources in anticipation of uh, women and girls probably having to come to the state to seek abortions. In New Jersey, where I reside, the state actually, in anticipation of Roe falling, introduced state legislation to protect the right to abortion. So there are, there are lots of things that states can do, but like Robin said, there are going to be tensions as well because of, you know, the, the, the demand. Because banning abortion doesn't stop it from happening. It just diverts in another direction and makes it unsafe. And that's what we're seeing. And just to be clear, in these blue states um, that are trying to ramp up, um, they don't suddenly have uh, you know, twice or three right. or four right. times as many abortion providers or four times as many clinics. No. Um, the people who are providing abortions in Ohio are not picking up their families and moving to Illinois. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take, even with infusion of money, even with will, even with people um, really wanting to do the right thing professionally, um, it's going to take time to be able to absorb those all of those extra people. Not everybody's going to get in. And if driving from Mississippi to Illinois <laughs> takes days. So there are people who, who can't get care and mm. there are people who can't afford a plane ticket. And the longer you delay, the farther your pregnancy goes on and then procedures take longer. Um, more expensive. And they're more expensive mm. and you know, can take days. Yeah. So, and many of the states that are still providing abortions still have waiting times or um, uh, w where there's a delay between the time of consent and the ability to get a, pr a procedure. Mm -hmm. um, I think women are turning to online sources. Mm -hmm. um, there is definitely some telemedicine, um, meaning provision of abortion pills through uh, a provider online which is um, frankly not actually legal um, in the states where the abortions are now illegal. Um, so there are people who are willing to sign prescriptions and send um, drugs and becoming criminals, essentially. Mm. So on that, I mean, that brings very nicely onto something we wanted to discuss, mm. which is we've mentioned women traveling from state to state, and we've now mentioned pills by post, that sort of thing. I wonder maybe, Richard, you, it was, this was in your article, if you could maybe touch on what other kinds of rights might end up coming under fire as a result of row falling. So I'm thinking of searching mail, I'm thinking of uh, rights to move between states, yeah, so in, in the Dobbs decision, Justice Kavanaugh wrote a concurring opinion. So he, he agreed, but he had his own reasons for agreeing. And I think it was his attempt to sort of soften the line a bit from Justice Alito's really quite harshly put uh, opinion. Uh, and in it, he emphasizes the right to travel between states as he sees this as a, as a federal right. Again, not one of those that's not actually, it's not kind of, explicitly spelled out in the Constitution. So it's interesting that he sees that one, mm -hmm. but not the, not the abortion uh, one. In the Job Dobbs majority opinion written by Alito, he effectively, one of the reasons why he 
says we're returning this to the states is because he says we don't want any more federal litigation on this. It's, it's time to get the federal courts out of it. And again, this is a, this is a deceit mm -hmm. because there are going to be many federal cases about abortion now, even more so, many more so than when Roe was in place because these questions about searching the, searching the mail, telemedicine, being able to move between states, can states prosecute doctors who are registered in their state but then go to another state to conduct the procedure, right? These are, these are all going to become live legal questions in a, in a way that they weren't simply under Roe. And what about sort of vigilante laws that have been popping up in some southern states? Yes. You have Texas and USB. They're not all southern, though. I mean, it's mm -hmm. Idaho, Oklahoma, and Texas. But these are the bounty laws that you heard Justice Sotomayor talk about. So if I took you across state lines mm -hmm. for an abortion that would be illegal where we started, Missouri, into Illinois, um, you know, I could be sued by you just you, uh, because you somehow learned this. Private citizen. Um, private citizen army. I could be sued by all of you, mm -hmm. and all of you would get your attorney's fees and $10,000 bounty from me for helping her. Multiple with people her. can sue one incident. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's an. I wrote an op-ed about this, but it's a, it's a strange law that even conservatives should not like because there's no connection to the state that's left in this law. They create people as attorney generals to enforce a state policy that they're not willing to enforce directly. Now, we do that sometimes. We have whistleblower statutes, especially in healthcare where there's healthcare fraud. But we do it because the state has an interest in what's being paid and because oftentimes it's the person inside of the healthcare group who has the best knowledge about the fact that there might be fraud. It's difficult for the state to know that. But you are just randomly stumbling into this knowledge about me mm -hmm. and suing me. And the state's not even there in this play. It's stepped off the stage. The idea is to have a chilling effect, really. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, so what they're doing is rather than the state using its own resources to prosecute someone. It's trying to create a effectively an almost private lawsuit between some random person and someone who is aiding in some way uh, an, an abortion. And, you know, this, as you said, conservatives could, you know, there are other issues you can turn this around. And actually, the right would not, you know, if you apply these to issues on the right, they wouldn't like it either. So it's, it's a very... Um, it's a dubious one, but the court actually had an opportunity to address this issue uh, last year and just punted on it because, effectively, because they had, I think they already had their plans in place for using the Mississippi law to overturn Roe. But it's the state that's paying out the money. Yes, right? it's, and it's, it's, a, it's not, I mean, it's a, it's a large sum, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's not... Um, you know, a kind of an enormous sum, but the idea is that it's it's about enough to persuade to dissuade people from action. Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, they we already know that there were instances in lockdown of various organisations using people's or various search engines selling data to organisations to tell whether or not they were breaching lockdown. It's just absolutely mm. terrifying to think. Imagine you're a young girl who can't drive, doesn't have a lot of money of her own. You wouldn't there want was to a film about this actually. anybody. Because anybody that you tell becomes complicit in your act mm. of illegality, subject to prosecution. You certainly wouldn't want to go to a medical professional who would end up, potentially could be prosecuted as a criminal. It, and you can't get to across the country to a completely different state on your own. And so it's very understandable that a lot of people will turn to attempted self-abortions or mm -hmm. online pills, things like that. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if we could just briefly touch on what we're kind of expecting to see in terms of the rises in maternal mortality. Uh, is this going to be similar, analogous to pre row so, or Like the Lancet editorial, the prestigious medical journal in the UK, ran a, their editorial ran a title saying that Justice Alito and the others have blood on their hands. Mm -hmm. That's quite an image. Do you agree? I think that's true. I, I don't think it will be potentially the same degree that we saw in the 60s or mm -hmm. earlier when um, the unsafe methods that women would attempt, things I'm sure that you've seen pictures or read of people using coat hangers or other kinds of 
crochet hooks to actually um, you know, insert into their uterus on their own. And these are very, or sticks or other kinds of things that are very dangerous and um, have high rates of, of death. Now that we have medical abortion pills, um, there, it is much safer to provoke an, a, an abortion. Um, there are questions of quality, there's questions of provenance, there's question, you know, th there are many issues. It doesn't solve all problems, but I don't think that we'll see the same, um, uh, the same rate of death from, from those types of abortions that we did uh, from other types of unsafe abortions. However, we probably will see some of those other types of unsafe abortions that happened before Roe. I think we also need to consider the fact that um, the risk is much higher for certain groups of women, right? Because of the relative disadvantage and additional barriers that they face. So it's no secret that in the United States, African-American women, Native American women, Latina women have much higher rates of um, maternal mortality, the risk of injuries, uh, and less access to safe abortion. Among those, there are also lots of migrant women and women who do not, are simply not able to access services to the same extent that maybe women with resources have. I mean, typically, you know, for women with, for women living in poverty, abortion is always more unsafe. They always face additional barriers. Now, throw into that mix structural racism, um, other histories of, uh, and other types of, uh, factors, women and girls with disabilities. Um, they already have less access. They are the ones at greatest risk. Even what we were talking about earlier, so now this additional burden on states like New York and Illinois. Yes, there are going to be women and girls coming from other states, but those who were disadvantaged to begin with are going to be even more disadvantaged, going to have even less access. So that is something that we really do need to pay attention to in the United States. What are we going to do to prevent very high levels, relatively high levels of maternal mortality, morbidities? I mean, unsafe abortion can also cause things like infertility. Um, and there can also be complications. What about the fact that many women and girls are going to be forced to carry pregnancies to term and become mothers against their will. It's not only the physical injuries, but the impact on their, on their lives, their personal development, their opportunities for education, employment. So when you consider all of those potential consequences, we're looking at some very serious problems and, and outcomes. One, and one thing we haven't said yet, which um, sometimes I forget to say, because I think everyone knows, is that maternal mortality um, in the states that have um, banned abortion are already the states that have the highest maternal mortality. Mm. There. So just before we move on to the final section, I wonder, we've talked about the kind of medical impacts of overturning Roe and some of the legal impacts. Um, I wondered if we could quickly discuss the sort of criminalization in the sense of what sorts of people are going to be at risk of being imprisoned uh, as a result of miscarriages, abortions, or aiding and abetting in? And what will that do to the medical profession to trust among doctors and to training for new doctors? I'll take this one. So, you know, I actually would, I want to know more about the cases that you were talking about earlier, but I don't think that the Texas Attorney General is going to go after a woman that had an abortion. I, despite my saying, oh my God, you, I don't think they're <laughs> going to go after you or the Uber driver. I think what's going to happen is they're going to look at the claims payment managers at large insurers. And this is actually deeply relevant in Illinois because we, ha we are the home in Chicago of the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, the Joint Committee Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations. Blue Cross, Blue Shield, you know, um, uh, geez, almost a Cigna, every major insurer. And they are all writing laws and rules, I'm sorry, policies right now about what abortions are going to be covered for insureds in a particular plan in a particular state. And many of those same insurers are actually third party administrators, so they're just the insurer for Medicaid. And right now they're in a vice because federal law, the Hyde Amendment, 
um, which was about, it's a, an annual rider that is in our budget that has always been sort of pro-life in the sense of saying that even though federal dollars can't pay for uh, abortion, it, they must be there to pay, or they can be used to pay for abortions in cases of life of the mother, rape, and incest. There was a short period of time in the 80s for four years where it included health of the mother. It was taken back out. So the feds are saying to the states that have Medicaid coverage right now, you have to pay for abortion in instances of rape or incest. But there are 15 states that say that's illegal. And so if the claims manager writes a policy, it's going to be those folks, I think, that are really going to be at risk. And then it turns out that under Texas's eight laws, a person for purposes of violating the law includes a corporation. A person for purposes of aiding and abetting what are, what's felony murder under some of these statutes includes an individual working at a company. And so if they make a simple mistake, they can be fined, they can be imprisoned. So I don't think it's you. It's going to be Blue Cross Blue Shield or Cigna. And that's going to have a tremendous chilling effect. Do, do you not think that they will also prosecute providers? I do. I mean, I'm not trying to dismiss that, but I'm just trying to think. So I started trying to calculate the fees, the fines. They're $10,000. So when you look um, for some of the, the violations, when you look at that, if you wrote a claims processing rule about, I don't know, pick a state that doesn't have one of these things, let's say incest in Mississippi. So when Mississippi says no, federal law is saying yes. However many people have that happen that's paid for by Medicaid, suddenly you multiply that by all the felonies, all the fines, and for a large company, that's a lot of money. That's where I think they'll spend their time because it's going to have the greatest chilling effect. You know, we've already seen chilling effects. There was a, a really, you know, evocative piece in Time magazine the other day about a couple that wanted an abortion. I don't know if you would have seen it, but they needed an abortion because they had a baby that they very much wanted to bring to term, that they had um, mm -hmm. gone through assisted conception, I believe, to get. And then the baby has like a, a fetal heartbeat problem, um, and it's going to put the life of the mother at risk. And so they immediately start, they're in Ohio, so they immediately start looking for a provider that can terminate this pregnancy. Um, and it was one for a child that they wanted to welcome, but it was going to cause the woman to die. And they managed to have a three-day window in Michigan where they could get a Michigan hospital to actually do that procedure. So you're seeing chilling effects. Um, and outside of that three-day window, the hospital wasn't willing to do that. And it was a period between the law being there and then the law being enjoined and the law not and law being there again. Can I just talk a little bit about the political implications of this as well? So in these states, the, these, as we mentioned before, a lot of these laws were, the, use the political science term, signaling leg legislation, legislation that was signaling to a, a constituency, a base, but not necessarily intended to go into effect. Some of the more recent ones, I think they saw what was happening. But if you go back 10 years ago, after the 2010 midterm elections, a lot of anti-abortion pieces of legislation mm -hmm. uh, in the state governments. The thing we have to remember is that consistently polls show that fewer than a fifth of Americans support total ban on abortion. Mm -hmm. It never, never gets above 20% in, in, in the polls. A third of Republican voters are uh, in some form pro-choice. Um, but the Republican representation is much more anti-choice. So there's not a single uh, pro-choice Republican in the House and there are only two in the Senate. And in the state legislatures, it's, it's a similar, perhaps not quite as extreme, but a similar pattern. These laws now are, they may be popular with particularly Republican primary voters, but now that they're in effect, there's a potential of a backlash against some Republican state legislators, and they're gonna to have to make decisions 
about now what the real consequences of the laws that they once supported mm -hmm. are. And it would be interesting to see if some actually have a change of heart. Mm -hmm. Do you think we might see in the midterms potentially some indication that this issue is a, a real issue, more than perhaps voters thought that it was before they saw the consequences of what the what the laws would mean and and going forward i think not just thinking about it just in this immediate term but actually in terms of what republican candidates do in primary elections and what they do in general elections and uh, i i think that one of the obviously we've been a very doom and gloom panel so. one of the potential um things to to keep an eye on that's not as doom and gloom is that potentially pro choice voices within the Republican Party might become a bit more vocal than they once were. Well, I want to say one thing, though, about the midterm. So, you know, we have kind of mixed signals, even at the short period of time that we've had. Kansas had a referendum mm -hmm. um, which would have amended the Kansas Constitution to ban abortion. And it's just, you know, resoundingly trounced. Okay, so that's a hopeful note. And then you have Indiana that passed like the 56th law in the last few years. Um, and it's, you know, it's restrictive, but in the course of that, um, the back and forth over that law, it progressively became more, uh, less restrictive, let's just say. Mm -hmm. So I think the difficulty with this feel, with, with, with the anger actually showing up in these elections is that none of the elections are as focal as Kansas. Kansas was like a straight up vote on an amendment to the constitution. So people have to say yes or no, but the rest of our elections are about lots and lots of things like our economy, you know, and, and all the other issues that people care about. And so the straight up vote isn't there. Um, now I think the one place it will show up are the three governors in states that, um, you know, it's likely that a Democrat will win, but the state houses are resoundingly Republican. Mm -hmm. And the governor can choose not to sign those Republican laws. And so I think in those places where the race really stacks up with the issue, it might matter. Mm -hmm. If I may just add to that, and I think one positive trend that we're also seeing that there are some places where uh, a much higher number of women are also registering to vote now. So that's mm -hmm. very positive. But at the same time, there's been such a lot of manipulation around voting rights that there have been many successful attempts to actually make it more difficult for people to vote. So certain people, certain communities, uh, again, especially the ones who are already socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, African-Americans, people of color, um, they're facing, they're going to be, in, they're going to encounter more difficulties in actually being able to vote because of mm. a lot of, yeah. um, well, population. we've, we've kind of rolled over naturally into our kind of third section of, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good. It's a wonderful conversation, but yeah, of kind of, okay, this is the present. These are the impacts. We've talked about that. And we're thinking now about what's happening next. So the midterms are coming up, but we also did touch on them briefly. So I'd just like to come back to them explicitly on, you said, when I said they haven't banned abortion, you said not yet. not yet. So there is, you know, a Life at Conception Act has been introduced, which would define a fertilized egg, so a zygote and then an embryo. So it has been introduced by one American um, senator and th things like this that would mean that as a human being. <laughs> is that possible? Do you think it will happen? And similarly on the ideas on gay marriage, <laughs> sodomy laws, will those be un undone as well? Where are we heading? Le legislation at a federal level is very difficult, not least because of the um, supermajority, effective supermajority requirement in the Senate with a filibuster. So even if the Republicans gain control of the House and Senate this year and the Republican won the White House in two years' time and they maintained a unified control, it's very unlikely that they would have 60 Republican senators, and even if they had 60 Republican senators, which they're not going to have, they're not going to all be representing in states mm -hmm. that want uh, that kind of legislation. So I don't think that legislation is the area to be most concerned about. I think the court's approach to substantive due process and a lot of these other substantive due process rights um, that, are, that are built into it are much more fragile now. So Clarence Thomas, who voted to 
support the Dobbs decision, wrote his own concurrence, which went further than Justice Alito. So rather than moderating, he went further. And he said it's time to consider all of the substantive due process cases. So these are the, the, the contraception, um, effectively gay sex case, gay marriage case, etc. So these are now in the firing line in a way that was unimaginable a year ago. But to be honest, the Dobbs decision was unimaginable five years ago. So I think we have to be alert to that. Yeah, I think if the fall of Roe has taught us anything is that not to be complacent and anything is possible. Um, it is important to focus on the fact that the Women's Health Protection Act, which has made it through Congress twice, which would provide protections for abortion and a whole range of reproductive health services. And that's the other thing. You can't just look at abortion alone. as a, It's not a standalone issue. It's connected to a range of things, access to contraception, maternal health care, and uh, many other things as well. So there has to be a strong focus on getting that through. So how does that get it passed into national law? It really is through um, the legislative process. And so voting counts. So what voters do and how they vote, the people that they choose to represent themselves is going to make a huge difference. And that's going to determine whether or, you know, whether a federal ban on abortion comes into place or the women's, something like the Women's um, Health Protection Act comes into place. The United States is also one of the very few, I think one of the few countries in the world, when you consider its resources, um, does not have federally mandated maternity leave. It doesn't provide, you know, there's no law mandating maternity the women leave. Women who have a force to carry pregnancy to term may not even get maternity leave. Most will not. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, what you said brings us nicely on to, I think, our final question, because we want to have some time for audience questions after mm -hmm. that, which is, I'm sure, something you might all have your own perspective on, which is just what, what do we do now? What, are the, what is the route to clawing back some of these rights and freedoms that have been lost through Roe, both on the sort of state level, uh, the international stage, uh, the federal level, and on sort of a more grassroots campaign level, uh, including what are some of the arguments that you think sort of work best when you're, mm -hmm. when you're discussing with somebody uh, why the morality of abortion might be less important to discuss than the real world consequences of what bans do. Well, I just want to take a dissent to Richard's point um, for just a second. Congress doesn't do anything. Okay, so just don't worry about this. Um, I would say that the states are where all the action is, honestly, on many, many issues. And I want to dissent to, I don't know what Clarence Thomas was thinking when he said that. Ironically, the man did not mention interracial marriage, even mm -hmm. though he's in an interracial marriage. So bracket that for a second. But I don't believe that things like gay marriage or contraception are in the crosshairs. Okay, the Griswold case about contraception, which preceded Roe, still sits there as good law. And it was grounded in the privacy of the marital bedroom. Okay, so I just don't see these things at risk. If you go look at a Burgafell, our national gay rights decision, it stood one foot on due process um, in the right to marry in those lines of cases, one of which was, in fact, Roe. But the other was equal protection, that you can't make an explanation for why two men or two women married should not have the same protections as people who are opposite gender. Um, and... And unlike become the fracturing that we've seen progressively over time around abortion since Roe, we've only become more united in the United States about gay marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, the way forward, I think, is to take a page, steal the playbook from gay marriage, and actually try to humanize the need for abortion in ways that even Republican lawmakers are going to respond. And you have to remember that those 10 states that enacted same-sex marriage voluntarily before the court told them they had to do anything and the District of Columbia, often the people who were choke points, who held a deciding vote, were Republicans. Go see New York Senate. Republicans enacted that law. So what it took to get them to see the humanity of couples that wanted the protection of law, that same kind of argument has to be made here. 
about rape exceptions, incest exceptions, life of the mother. Well, that, I think, is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. I think hopefully we can agree on that. Um, but the rest, not so much. So we're going to suddenly have to argue to people that we probably don't share very many priors with why they need to do this. I agree with humanizing. Um, stigma is a huge issue with, with abortion. And I think unlike um, the movement for gay marriage where there was definitely a push for coming out and letting everybody know in your life um, that you're out and you're proud, uh, that really brought home to people that they knew people who were gay. And I think one of the issues with abortion is people don't talk about their abortions. And statistically, in the States, one in four women, and, and recently, it used to be one in three women had had an abortion. That means that in this room, many, many people have had abortions, and we need to talk about it. We need to advocate about it. We need to have panels like this. Um, and everyone needs to advocate, and that includes, for my group of people, um, providers and obstetricians, gynecologists. It's an a critical part of our profession and a way that we keep people healthy and, um, frankly, alive. It's also about accountability, I think, and really questioning the role of the state. When you have a state, when you have public officials introduce laws and policies and use the resources of the state to put people in harm's way, there has to be a fundamental questioning of that. And whether you do that on the basis of your own constitutional framework or international legal framework. I mean, speaking as a human rights lawyer from an international legal perspective, the United States is in complete violation of its international obligations as far as abortion goes or any other health service, really. I mean, governments have a duty to refrain from certain acts. So, for example, criminalization and the introduction of restrictions. They also have positive obligations to ensure access to health care, the availability, affordability of services, to ensure that a health system exists that can provide access even to address abortion stigma. So I think it also boils down to really questioning whether in this instance even, has the state done its duty? Has the court acted in accordance with the law? Has it fulfilled its obligations? Has it acted ethically? Or has it shown itself to be what many described right after the day that it happened as a very radical court that, is, that has ruled based on religious ideology? So I think that approach has to be fundamentally questioned because for the longest time, people had a lot of faith and always thought at the end of the day, the institutions are strong and our rights will be protected. But if, what Roe has also shown us is that our institutions are not as infallible as we thought they were and we cannot rely on them alone. Can I say one word about international law? So it would matter here. It doesn't in the United States. It just doesn't. I mean, we're the only country in the world that has not ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Somalia has. Okay, Yemen, all kinds of countries have said this needs to happen. And I pick Somalia and Yemen for a reason. They were the last two, immediately last two ratifiers of the convention before the United States, which stands alone now. Mm. So we are incredibly isolationist. Um, and I love what you're saying about, mm -hmm. you know, international law and we should pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. But that argument wouldn't even get cognizance. Now, it did when Justice Kennedy was alive. He cared very much about that and he centered the court. But he's gone. And now I think the lower courts, I don't even think would give necessarily con cognizance to this, which is almost unfathomable, but it's true. Yeah. But I beg to differ because actually, legally speaking, the United States has signed. So you mentioned what they have not ratified, right? But they have signed and ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. They've signed and ratified the Convention Against Torture, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. They have signed CEDAW, the Women's Convention, CRC. They haven't ratified it. But, you know, once a government, once a state signs a convention, they cannot do anything that defeats the object and the purpose of the convention. So what they are doing is blatantly in violation. Politically, yes, in the United States, there is a very high level of exceptionalism. And there is a public discourse and a narrative where international law is disregarded 
because there is not a willingness to comply, there is often an eagerness to use it to call out other states, but there isn't a commitment to actually comply with it nationally. That being said, the United States regularly reports to the Human Rights Committee, uh, the, con the Committee on the Convention Against Torture and other committees. It participates in the Universal Periodic Review where it's reviewed by its peers and recommendations are made. Recommendations have also been accepted. Speaking of special procedures, mandates like mine, the United States invites mandates to conduct country visits. And they do country visits and they write up reports and make recommendations. The most recent visit was conducted by the international expert on sexual orientation, gender identity. Last year, the special rapporteur on minority rights. Several years ago, my mandate. So on the one hand, there is engagement. And in Geneva, the United States, like many other member states, engages in dialogue around international human rights law and advocates for it. They say they're a champion, even in New York. I have been in the same room in the United Nations with the United States as well as other governments where they have very specifically expressed their commitment to sexual and reproductive rights as well. So there is a double standard. Mm -hmm. That I agree. And in the public perception and general discourse, there is a disregard or th there's this perception does it, that it doesn't really count. And in courts of law, yes. And I think this speaks to legal education as well in the United States. In law school, it's taught as a just any other subject. But even when it's taught, there is it's taught with this. Um, in the spirit of except with the spirit of exceptionalism as well. Not that this actually applies, although the United States engages. So it, it really is a mixed bag. I think those who want to use international law, and there are advocates who do use international law. I mean, Ru even Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote about it. There are Supreme Court cases concerning uh, death penalty for juveniles, in prison, life sentences for juveniles, and also in relation to affirmative action, where international law and legal standards have been brought to bear on those cases by the courts. So I wouldn't say it's completely irrelevant, but... Um, maybe it has to be invoked more. Yeah, and in a strategic Kennedy way. cases. We heard. Yeah. Sorry, I think we really want to get the audience. Mm -hmm. We have to ask some questions, and we're running very out of time. But we have heard a number of different um, strategies there. But if anybody from the audience has a question they would like to ask, awesome. Yeah, um, Laura, would you like to choose? So services by Planned Parenthood. Yeah, well, so Planned Parenthood is a is the I think the largest provider in the United States of contraception for um, especially for young people. Uh, so and and a major um, you know way that they make income or an incu income. Um, revenue stream is through providing abortions. So abortions aren't necessarily the biggest part of these clinics, but it is what drives revenue. So I think that there is a real risk mm -hmm. that um, many of these Planned Parenthoods will close. And that would mean it will be much harder for women in these states, um, in particular young women and not just women, everyone to get contraception. Any other questions from anybody? Yeah. Uh, so mental health is one of the largest looming health crises at the moment. And um, so if we imagine women in, uh, within the lower socioeconomic ranks, you know, like we've spoken about, will significantly experience even more barriers to getting abortions, for example, traveling to states where it is legal. So um, as an upside, are we seeing any increased um, focus on mental health support for these women or even an increased conversation on how this can potentially affect their mental health? And not just them, but also mental health in general in the population. There was an issue raised earlier about this, the, the Hyde Amendment, which was um, 
Medicaid is a means-tested public health insurance program in the United States, and the Hyde Amendment severely restricts access to abortion using Medicaid uh, funds. And so that's meant since the 19, I think 1976, Hyde was first passed. So since the 1970s, poor women, working class women, disproportionately women of color, have already struggled to get access to abortion on the same terms as, as women who are more able to pay. And that was, of course, the case before Roe as well, when people had to travel and, and so on. And so we're very much, we, were, we weren't in a place of equality even under Roe, and we're now going back much further. And so many of the kinds of uh, other forms of medical assistance are uh, as, as, as extremely important. Unfortunately, the, the healthcare system in the United States is extremely patchy anyway, so that um, this just compounds all of these uh, additional inequalities that people are, are facing. Yeah, any? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm coming from Malta, a country which has a complete ban on abortion. And my question is mainly aimed at Melissa, but seeing that you saw the process of Nepal going from complete ban to legalization, in my country, we cannot even start a conversation. There was a proposal about decriminalization of abortion, and that just caused complete uproar. Mm -hmm. So as a citizen, as common citizens, what can we do to start the conversation and get the process moving along? Yeah, I think one thing that has made a huge difference in the, uh, many of the countries where there has been reform, and reform often happens incrementally. Um, I think, you know, we would be extremely lucky if abortion was decriminalized overnight in a country where it's been criminalized for so long, right? Um, but I think social movements are very important. Uh, public education is very important. And it's really important for different movements to work together. I think Argentina is a recent example where you had not only health advocates, like they didn't work alone, but the labor movement, health movement, politicians, many others, allies in government sort of came together and they advocated, they worked hard over time. So there are a number of examples like that. I'm happy to speak to you more after this event, but I think that makes a huge difference. And that's also what we need to see in the United States. And that's also where the con conversation is going. Like I've spoken to the AFL-CIO, you know, people there, they're talking about connecting more with those involved in sexual and reproductive health advocacy now, especially in light of what has happened with Roe. So it's very important for movements to work together. Mm. I'm going to go with this gentleman who's been trying to get my attention. <laughs> um, is there anything in places like Oxford like, and, and Atlanta, liberal cities kind of help capture like certain states can do or they just kind of track? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, they're trapped. <laughs> 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 um, so there are some clever things being done. You know, your point about pills being shipped into a state. You know, the, the difficulty with all of this is that the states under our Constitution are charged with the general welfare of the citizens, okay? So if I sent pills to Austin, Texas, and somebody used them, you know, it, it might be clear that it was me. And so one of the things that I understand people are exploring are like post office boxes in blue states that can't really be looked into. So I send a pill to the post office box, post office box sends it to you. I think there are things like that that, you know, could happen. The other thing that happened with gay rights is what happened in the United States is it came up from the bottom. The municipalities were the mm -hmm. ones to pass the LGBT non-discrimination laws mm -hmm. in America. And then it was when they tipped and, and there was a critical mass. So you have to look at, um, you know, you have to sort of look at home, what's called home state rule inside of that state and whether a municipality could turn itself into an island of blue inside of a sea of red. But that's what happened with LGBT rights. Mm. I'm afraid this has to be the last question, but I believe that all of our speakers are coming to the orator immediately afterwards. So feel free to accost them and ask the rest of your questions. In <laughs> Maybe the not accost. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we've spoken like a lot about the impact on America, but um, what's been missing from this is about the impact on the international stage and, for example, us here in the UK, because I don't think it's um, an exaggeration to say that America has massive world power, yeah. not even just legislation, but soft cultural power. Um, where Where is this leading for us? What does this mean for abortion rights internationally, nationally here in the UK, and for sort of the feminist movement as a whole, yeah. you might say. Yeah. I, I can quickly respond to that. It's very bad, and it has emboldened uh, <laughs> opponents, and we're, we're already seeing the impact of that uh, at many levels, including at the Human Rights Council. There's a much stronger presence of anti... Um, not just anti-choice, but anti-gender equality. You know, a lot of issues are being brought together under one umbrella now, so I think we're facing bigger challenges because uh, those forces have been emboldened. They are already very well organized. They are very well resourced. And actually, a lot of the money, I mean, there have been investigative reports done by Open Democracy, and there are other sources as well that show that a considerable amount of funding also comes from, originates in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we are facing more challenges now. The backlash is even stronger. I would say it's been taken to another level altogether. I actually might add something to that very quickly, just from the university <laughs> level. Um, there have already been investigations showing the amount of money coming in from uh, international pro-life organizations to the UK since Roe has fallen, has mm. just skyrocketed, because previously the US was the winnable battleground and a lot of money was going in there. But now that they've won that, there is a lot of excess money to go into other places. And mm. although I don't think we're in sort of imminent danger of anything catastrophic happening in the UK, you have already seen things like the Right to Life website has had a little facelift and it's now mm. appears much more quickly on, they've done some SEO optimization and it will come up now when you search things. Uh, it's very well funded. University groups have started to form coherent language. They've obviously realized what kind of approach works best. So they say we are generally promote a culture of life uh, that they've kind of, their branding is coming more in line. So I think we will see more grassroots movements at universities uh, and more politicians being emboldened mm. to say that they are also pro-life whereas they probably wouldn't have been so likely to before and if i may add just to that as well mm. we are also seeing u.s style protest tactics outside clinics we've had a lot mm. of work done that and i think it was just yesterday that bournemouth for example got a uh, buffer zone around its clinic but yeah there are certainly tactics that worked in the u.s are going to be exported and and on the good side, one concrete uh, thing to have come out of Roe is our society. So <laughs> I think we will have to end there. Um, but um, yeah, so we're going to end there for now. But I'd just like to thank our speakers and thank you all for coming, but especially to our speakers for coming. Yeah.